joining the team at VoiceFlow and working with uh, working with conversation designers, uh, it, it's given us plenty to think about about you know how we can improve this uh, improve this function in the conversation designers workflow. Um, and just, you know, what are the pain points and challenges that exist today and, and what are the opportunities moving forward? So I'd love, you know, I'm really looking forward to jumping into that. All right. Thanks so much, Rob. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob to share your screen for your presentation. Awesome. Yeah. So as I touched on, um, you know, just the, the topic of documentation around conversation design, uh, for conversation designers, for conversation design teams is, uh, is is certainly something that has been front and center for for us at the VoiceFlow team, uh, especially over the last kind of six months, uh, as we're starting to see more and more uh, conversation design teams pop up, and you know we're looking at you know what are the biggest pain points that these teams experience, and and specifically the conversation designers on those teams. And, and the one that keeps kind of popping up over and over is, is really around documentation. And um, a big genesis for this is conversation design has a lot of really unique challenges around documentation. Um, the, the context and content that is encapsulated in a conversation design uh, either has more uh, more functions or, or just certainly more unique function than maybe other design disciplines. Um, you know, we need to, you need to capture not only the contents, but situation of use, uh, the emotion of the user, the emotion of the system, tone and voice, how things are presented uh, along with the, you know, the high level user flows, um, the, the turns that, that need to be designed for this thing. There's so much context that exists to come together to create a conversation design that um, there, there's really not one kind of simple way to communicate all of this information. Um, and, and so, you know, our, our job as designers is to, to, to create the best possible solution that, that includes all of those, uh, all of those kind of functions that I outlined there. But the, uh, the, the major pain point that exists for conversation design teams is not like in, design, in defining all those elements, it's being able to communicate those designs accurately to the teammates they work with, to the stakeholders that they report to. Uh, there, there's a bit, of a, a bit of a case of broken telephone that, that a lot of conversation designers experience when trying, to, uh, when trying to hand off designs or when trying to um, pass their work into, you know, provide requirements to get their work built. Um, unfortunately, as designers and, you know, whatever dis design discipline you're in, your work isn't necessarily a usable end product for, for the customers you're designing for. Uh, you, you rely on designers, cop or sorry, developers, copywriters, um, you, you <laughs> QAs to get something uh, usable and tangible in market. And so it's, the, you know, the friction on this handoff of conversation designs to those who are actually bringing it to life uh, it, it is tough. It's, you know, it feels like broken telephone. And, and it feels like other design disciplines have largely kind of figured out what their core, uh, their core design artifact is. You know, for, for UX designers, they're the, the product mock-up is, is the thing that encapsulates all of the work done by the UX designer to design that solution. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's prototypes made on it or uh, animations are built out for these things, but ultimately the thing that is handed off uh, to development to, to build out a user experience design is a mock-up. And, you know, same with product managers. There's a lot of inputs to their work, but ultimately everything gets gathered up in a product requirements document. UX researchers, you know, even they've they've kind of uh, coalesced around the idea of a research summary or or this this tool of the research summary as the the primary artifact to to communicate um, what what they've learned and and to inform the work of of their teammates. 
Now, there's a couple, you know, there's a couple reasons why we don't have that kind of unified artifact agreed upon as conversation designers right now. Um, you know, a, a big a big reason for that is conversation design is a is a multifunctional role, um, and it requires the the conversation designer to wear a lot of different hats. Um, you know, you're part copywriter, you're part developer, you're part technical product manager, you're part UX designer, you're part therapist, you're part um, you know cat cat herder uh, when it comes to stakeholders sometimes, and you need to be able to do all of these these functions but the 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 output of your work tends to reflect the function so you know if you're when you're thinking about the work you do as a copywriter well that ends up coming out as a as a copy deck or or like a, a word document but your your developer uh you know when you put doing the developer aspects of your job you're you're creating json snippets or or, or outputting um you know working with nlps and nlus to train them uh, technical PM, it's about requirements documentation and things like that. UX designer, well, that's, you know, you're creating user flows, you're creating multimodal experiences, you're, you're maybe creating UX designs um, for, your, for your voice applications or your skills. And so, you know, the, as of today, it's, it's pretty obvious why, you know, it is such a multifunctional role. Like it, when you look at the backgrounds of the people working as conversation designers, uh, there's a lot of people coming into the into the profession from linguistics or UX design or, you know, content management, research, academia, um, and, and certainly from development. So you see the like the these multifunctional um, nature of the role being reflected in where people come into it. And you know, in the future, perhaps the role will will fragment a bit. So there might be a couple more a couple more focused disciplines within conversation design where you're a, uh, you know, you're, you're a conversation copywriter or a conversation writer. Um, but, but certainly right now, the majority of the people in the field are, are wearing all of these hats. Um, the, the next, you know, the next reason why we're kind of, we still don't have this, this unified conversation design artifact is, is our tooling is very fragmented as conversation designers. You know, as mentioned previously, for each different function in our work, we often um, we often employ a different tool for that job, and so you know a lot of those tools are very uh, are very general purpose. You know, we're applying applying a tool to fit our needs, and, and these tools are not actually built to solve our needs as conversation designers. Um, there, so there's there's not a lot of tooling out there that is you know custom built for conversation design use cases, and so that ends up in a lot of cases where the the uh, the tool is overkill for the job at hand. Um, if you want to if you want to test out a couple of a couple of uh, intents and, and utterances just to kind of get a sense of what your interaction interaction model is going to look like, coding something out in dialogue flow is is probably more work than is necessary um, you know, for the purpose that you're using it in that, in that case. Uh, next, you know, another, another real big challenge is just a very nascent industry. Um, voice, voice flow has been around for, for a year and a half, two years now, um, and we're one of the, the early people or early, early companies playing in this space. The, those that are, that are considered the you know, conversation design veterans typically have five years maybe worth of experience in this in this industry and so it's it's still like a growing industry and because of that um, that standardization really hasn't formed around uh, what the expectations for the role is and what the expected output of the job is I think you know as conversation designers we're still figuring out best practices for conversation design and and, and it's the same for our tools. It's so much of it is is really in the stage of discovery, figuring out what works best, what kind of patterns can we replicate over and over that work from project to project, from use case to use case. And so they're still just at the point of discovery within the conversation design field. Um, and, and because of that, you know, until that standardization is really there, you're you're going to see very fil very few purpose built tools. Uh, in the space, once you know, once there's a fairly identifiable pattern to uh, 
to, to replicate or automate with tooling, then you'll see more tools kind of come onto market. Um, for others like VoiceFlow and, 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 and the others that are in, in this space, you know, we're still trying to, we're, we're trying to figure out what, uh, what those patterns and standardizations for conversation designers are as we're building the tool. So um, the, the, the path isn't clearly defined. I, I, I often think of like the comparable of building a UX design tool when, when Figma came onto market, the, the core expectation for what a UX design tool had to do, had to, do to support a designer's workflow was, was pretty well established. Um, you know, the, the notion of having artboards and, and grid systems and, and, and color palettes, symbols even, um, all of that was really just kind of default as part of the designer workflow. And so, um, you know, they could come on and just kind of solve those problems in a better way or in a different way. But uh, that's just not the case in conversation design right now. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, I, don't, I don't say this as a gripe. I know this was kind of a common theme in the UX design or in the design community, but just like having a smaller seat at the table. But if you look, up the make, you look at the makeup of a lot of conversation design teams, um, they, or sorry, uh, yeah, conversation design teams or teams that are building conversational experiences, the conversation designer represents a very small fraction of that team. And what that means is we ultimately often end up defaulting to the preferences of our teammates and our stakeholders. Uh, our teammates and stakeholders often have established workflows. They've got established tools that they use as part of their workflow. And it's often easier and less friction, especially in the early days of uh, setting up a conversation design team to, uh, to just kind of go with what's known and, and try and make it fit for, for our, our use case and our workflow as conversation designers. So, you know, I think the everywhere that we cross over with developers in our workflow or with, with copywriters in our workflow, we're often defaulting to the, uh, to the tools that they, they prefer and the tools that they're, they're already using. So, so, sorry, fire truck. All right, so what is the goal for conversation design documentation? And I think this is, you know, as we look ahead, what is, what is a good conversation design artifact going to be able to do? This is something that we talk a lot about with our, with our users and, and just other designers in the industry as we have these conversations and, and talk about their workflow is, you know, what, it's less about what is the tool and more about what is the tool allow you to do? What's the, what's the job of that tool uh, of the, you know, good design documentation. And, and it's really kind of boiled up into these, into these three uh, functions. The first one is, is really acting as a single source of truth. Like right now we talk about the fragmentation of the tools that we use. Uh, what that means is like a different chunk of context for your end uh, conversation experience lives in a different place. Um, what the, what the, the, uh, the intents and, and, and what types of utterances we're expecting from to get from our uh, customers and users, you know, that lives somewhere in your interaction model on, on whatever platform you're using. Um, the, the copy, what are systems saying, that lives, in a, that lives in an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. The, uh, the visuals that are being used to, um, to create a multimodal user experience, those live off in, in Sketch or in, in Zeppelin or in Vision. Um, and because of that, you know, having, having all of these components of, of the conversation design fragmented out, it makes it so much harder to A, maintain your documentation um, because you've got to remember to update something in 10 different places, you kind of just end up not updating it. And as soon as do, you know, design documentation gets out of date, gets stale, then people aren't going to be relying on it as a source of truth. And so you know, the, the fewer sources that you need to maintain, the more likely you are to maintain it. And the more likely they are, you are to maintain it, the more likely people, your teammates are to use it um, as a point of reference, as the source of truth, uh, and, and, and to like frequently go back to it to, to get information to inform their work where you cross over with them. Um, secondly, 
with this fragmentation of our tools um, or, or lacking a single source of truth, uh, it, it's really hard to get a complete picture of what that end experience is. You know, con conversation designs, especially, it is a really hard, uh, it's a really hard thing to communicate what that end user experience is because as we said, there's so many functional components that go into designing that experience. And so, you know, the fewer, the fewer tools or the more, uh, the more aggregated all of your outputs as a designer are, it creates a com more complete picture for what that design experience is or for what that designed experience is. Um, and, and, and finally, the, you know, the, the fragmentation prevents, uh, prevents making your documentation accessible for your team. Uh, you want your documentation to be, uh, to be a tool for both collecting input and feedback from your, uh, from your teammates and from your users and from your stakeholders, as much as it is a tool for uh, output, for communicating your designs, explaining your designs, contextualizing your conversation designs. And so, you know, uh, having a single source of truth really, uh, or sorry, having, uh, having a, uh, you know, a good conversation design artifact, it's going to allow for a lot more of that, that interactivity. I think it's, uh, you know, just the challenge with a conversation design is unless it is interactive, it's really hard to envision, like go try and explain a conversational experience to somebody. And, you know, a, a wizard of Oz test where you play the role of the system like that, that's good for, for a 1% complete uh, version of your experience. But Ultimately, as you add more and more to it and design, you know, design it to kind of full, full fidelity, it's really, really hard for people to envision what this experience is like until they can get, it hand, get hands on with it or, or get interactive with it. Um, so you know, a, a good, good conversation design documentation is going to make it interactive, make it tangible. Um, and and you know, as, as designers, we want that because it gets us feedback. It gets us feedback from, it allows us to do customer research, it allows us to do user testing, it allows us to do stakeholder reviews, it allows us to do design reviews. Um, and, and, and that type of feedback is what's going to uh, m help us polish our designs, help us create better, stronger experiences, challenge a lot of the assumptions that we have that went into the design in the first place. So, you know, just for stronger design, it needs to be a, uh, your, your conversation design artifact needs to be good for both input and output. Cool. So just kind of jumping into this one a bit deeper. So you know, as a single source of truth, we talked about like all of the different functional aspects that go into an, you know, what, what is an end conversation design. And it's, it's, um, there's so many, uh, so many outputs from a conversation designer. It's, whatever the the single source of truth is it needs to be a multifunctional artifact uh you know it needs to be able to hand, to, be able to be able to communicate response content it needs to be able to communicate you know the, the same thing that your scripts and your copy decks would it needs to communicate technical requirements uh, how it integrates with your systems and services um, that that it's built on top of it needs to be able to uh, define user stories for to implement those technical requirements uh, it needs to inform AI training. It needs to be able to, um, to, to create data that you're using to, uh, to create a stronger NLP NLU for your, uh, for your use cases. It needs to uh, communicate what your interaction model is. What is the, like, what is the functional uh, components of interactivity with your conversational experience? And you know, imp output that in a way where it's usable, uh, ideally usable for, uh, for your development team to be able to build on top of. Uh, and, and where you're building, when you're building multimodal experiences, it needs to communicate what, uh, you know, what the visual experience that is layered on top of your conversational experience is. And so, you know, I think the, the, the case I'm going to make today is that, that the prototype is likely to be the, the best conversation design artifact that we have. And, and I don't just say that because it, it's something we do in voice flow. I, I say that because we believe that, and maybe that's, they're probably correlated. Um, but the, the prototype really is, um, you know, the best, the best tool we have at our hands. Uh, a lot of, a lot of conversation design teams we, we work with or we speak to, 
you know, they're often trying to build that and, and have invested in, in building their own prototypes for their own experiences. But, um, you know, because of the, the fragmented input in creating, in, in designing a conversation experience, it's really hard to create a prototype. But, you know, the pro, a good prototype is encapsulating all of those elements of the conversation de designer's output. It's, it's, it speak, it's showing, um, you know, what situation designs are required. It's, it's communicating how the visual experience overlays the, the voice experience or the conversational experience. Uh, it's, it's defining the specific uh, response content you have, but not only your response content, it's, it's how it's said, what, what is the emphasis, what's the, the emotion applied to the, the response content from your conversation design. Um, it outlines technical requirements. Where does this conversation design overlap with our systems or integrate or need to integrate with our systems? And, and ultimately, uh, it helps to communicate, you know, what is, what is the core functions that our conversation design is being, is being built to service? What are the, what are the intents um, that, that our conversation design needs to deliver on? And, and a good prototype allows you to uh, layer that context, over, or I guess, kind of build up these layers of context into it, and and really end up communicating all of the end requirements that you have, whether it's you know for your for your design uh, UX designers, whether it's for your your content team, whether it's for your developers. A good prototype is a communication tool for all of those people about what the requirements for your conversation design are. And so that kind of leads into to the, the second point there about having living documentation. Um, you know, a, a prototype is not, should not be thought of as, I guess, a step in the process and more so as a, uh, as a tool that you're using throughout your design process. Because if the goal here is to, is to make, your, uh, make your designs easily, more easily communicated, to make them interactive, uh, the, the prototype can serve that need every step along the way. You know, I've, I've, I've broken out a bit of an example here in VoiceFlow just to kind of communicate this concept, but the idea of, of the conversation design process, going from, from basically having a brief for a project or an idea for a project to having something that is, you know, a skill that is live on Alexa, having a voice assistant that's in market, there's, a, there's this process that a conversation designer and their team goes through to increase the fidelity of the solution that they're creating. Um, from, from very, very high level and vague upfront when they're researching and doing discovery to, um, to very detailed and, and specific about how it handles certain situations or how it interacts in certain situations when, when you get there. But um, you know the prototype can, can live at, be a tool for the conversation designer throughout this life cycle. And so, you know, it really, it really starts with sample dialogues. You know, I think that's where a lot of, uh, a lot of teams ultimately start their workflow, but it's, you know, you're just, you were typically using word documentation and, and that's fine. You know, you can start bring the, use the tool that uh, that's best for creating the content, but having that single source of truth for being able to, to, find that content, like being able to just link off um, from your prototype to your sample dialogues or bring in the primary context about it. You know, what are the, what are the intents that we're outlining in these sa sample dialogues? You know, these are the core, these are the core pieces from sample dialogues that inform kind of the next step in the workflow. So we want to bring that into our, uh, into our prototype kind of from, from the first step, I guess, you know, that's, that's not really useful as a prototype, but you can start to, you know, think about how you can actually layer in more and more of that context directly into your prototype. You could actually just, you know, write out your, your conversation, um, write out your dialogue samples directly in, you know, on, on your, on your prototype, or you can actually just make your, your, uh, your dialogue, your sample dialogues, um, interactive here. And, and, you know, I think for the purpose of a sample dialogue, the whole point is just to kind of hear it in action and and get a feel for whether it's a it's a natural flow of a conversation. Is that a natural back and forth that two two people would go through 
to uh, allow one of those people to meet their objective. Now in this, in this insurance, uh, insurance virtual assistant example here, you know, that's, that's just what we're trying to, we're trying to do. We've, we've written out our sample dialogues, but we've done it as a prototype so that we can, you know, we can hear what it sounds like. Hey, how can I help you today? Hi, I'd like to find out if my dental plan covers Invisalign. Sure thing. I'll just need your eight digit account ID to look that up. It's nine, three, four, seven, eight, two, one, zero. And so you can get, you can get a sense of taking this, you know, take, taking this off, uh, off of like the page from being a flat artifact, um, that someone needs to read and, and, and certainly interact with another human to, to experience. You can start to think about a prototype, even just as, uh, the first way to, to make your, uh, your de conversation design ideas more tangible. I think that's, you know, it's maybe a bit of a stretch of a use case there, but uh, it's, I, I think we're looking at opportunities just to make our work interactive as conversation designers, uh, more interactive from, from day one. And once we have sample dialogues written out, you know, it's, and we've got a good sense of what that core concept is, the goal from there is really to figure out, okay, what are the core actions needed from uh, needed to serve that experience? And that's really when you get into, you know, defining what your interaction model looks like. And so at that point, you take these sample dialogues and you start to break them out into uh, what your interaction model is. And we, you know, we've seen this done in, in Excel spreadsheets as a, as a way to just think about what are the intents? What are the utterances? What are the slots we're filling within each of those utterances? Uh, how do those overlap over across different, different utterances? You know, what's the relationship between these things? Um, but a prototyping tool is going to, going to allow you to kind of build the, the interaction model uh, to, to, power that, to power that prototype and, and take that context out of the tool to be able to pass it off as, a, as an artifact. So I think it's, you know, in terms of what we're trying to do as designers at this stage is we really want to test out a lot of the logic and the assumptions around what, what intents we're defining here, what kind of utterances are going to be used. And again, it's really just, can you have an interactive tool that allows you to test some of those assumptions? And so, you know, when it comes to, to prototyping your interaction model, it's really just having, you know, a generic prompt that allows people allows you to capture what types of what types of uh, use cases are people thinking they're going to be able to use this uh, this experience for or you know this skill for or this voice assistant for, and so you can start to see what are the gaps in the intents I have or what utterances aren't we capturing with this, and really help to refine and refine your work by having that interactive tool. You know a lot of a lot of uh, people aren't necessarily using this as a for customer research, but even just doing some internal research, sending it over, sending it around to the team, sending it around to uh, stakeholders, people who have some context of what the scope of the project would be, um, just just to get a sense of where the major gaps are. Uh, having an interactive interaction model prototype is is a fantastic tool for that. Um, you know, and, and and then ultimately to be able to capture that context, document it. I know we, we, in Voicefully, you can do that right on Canvas with markup, or you know, if you do need to pass this off into a JIRA ticket, um, you know, ultimately you can link back to your prototype as a source of truth for like, here is how this intent is supposed to behave. Here is, here is the intended user experience for this intent when someone in, interacts with it in our conversation design. And once you've got the once you've got the interaction model defined, then then your goal is to really turn that into kind of a, co a cohesive end to end end experience that uh, that captures captures the ideal use case, the ideal scenario with the ideal user going through it. Um, and, and so this is where you get more into the territory of what prototyping tools are used for uh, currently. Is now you're starting to be able to design out, uh, design out user flows or design out turns in a conversation that, um, that enable the user to, to complete the job they intended to do by using your skill or your voice assistant or to be able to um, complete the end-to-end -end experience. And so 
this is where you start to start to bring more fidelity to it. But at the same point, like a happy path design is really a dumb prototype. It's not going to necessarily, it's not going to be integrated to your systems. It is purely a representation of that end-to-end -end use, use case. So you're still relying, you know, your, your, your design at this point is re really consists of just defining the interactions uh, and, and some of the logic used to power those, the various flows through that happy path. And so you can start to, uh, again, you know, flesh out that experience, but, but you want it to be interactive. And, and so, you know, building, building on what you created with your interaction model, you can now start to slot those intents in around some of those responses you defined in your sample dialogues up front. And so you start to see how we started with kind of the, the responses and interactions, and then we layered on the interaction model. And now we're starting to layer on the user experience around that interaction model with our happy path design. And, and the prototype is just evolving at each step in the process. Then you start to, you know, you start to harden your, uh, harden your use case and figure out what all the unhappy paths are, what all the, what all the error states you're going to need to handle, where are we going to need repair paths built into this documentation or built into our designs. Um, and, and this is where making your conversation design much more of a team sport uh, is, is really beneficial. And so the, you know, as a, so, Coming from a coming from a design background, I I know I have I have some decent ideas, but I know I'm extremely short sighted in, in certain cases, and my ideas suck in others. And so, the it's really helpful to get the input in the context of the team, um, and and this is really the best the best place where, or where it's most valuable because there's going to be a lot of people that have uh, you know within your team within your stakeholder groups. Uh, you know, within your client client base, if you're if you're working with uh, in client services, where they're going to have context about you know different edge cases that that users could run into in your designs, and so having your prototype um, as a tool that that communicates what the current design is, but also as a canvas for them to be able to overlay feedback and context and 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 call out these pain points it creates a much better feedback loop for us as designers because they're providing feedback in context. And so we don't need to um, have somebody explain tr by memory what step in the flow and what exactly they said to trigger, trigger an error case that, you know, or, you know, need, a tr need an error case that wasn't there. And so, you know, again, just making our tooling more accessible for people to be able to get context and then provide it uh, really helps us work through these like, uh, you know, what, what is the majority of conversation design where we're just defining the unhappy paths. And then, you know, once we have this, this kind of an end to end flow figured out, now it start to, now it's time to layer on to that all right well what are all the different situations of use that are going to require uh nuances to that experience that are going to require variants on that experience that are going to require um subflows to to support and so you know again it's similar similar to the previous function but you can start to think about okay where are the points where where the where are the points in this in our prototype in our conversation design where um, different situ user situations are going to account for or you know different different real world contexts not necessarily specific to the user where the weather is going to impact what the experience is going to be or where their location is going to impact what their experiences are going to be or whether that user has signed into your experience and authenticated already. Um, or what their role on their on their account is, how that's going to alter their experience. And you, so you can start to like um, visualize where these points of deviation in the experience are, um, or or where where those variants get introduced into your conversation design by thinking about context design. And so again, prototypes are really good tool because uh, a, a, as you start to test, and you're probably at a point where you can start to do some some user testing. With your with your designs, once you have a uh, 
once you have kind of a full end-to-end -end design created, where you can start to test with some end users perhaps, and they're gonna be the ones that really expose um, what are the different contexts of use that we need to consider in our full-fledged design. And so again, you, know, you can start to see how this has evolved from sample dialogues to interaction model to uh, repair paths, unhappy paths. Now, you know, that, that gave us this one kind of fully fleshed out end-to-end -end flow that we can walk people through. Um, and now it's figuring out what are all the variations on the flow. And so now we've got our, our designs have just increased 10 times in complexity now that we have to like encapsulate all of these different situations of use. Um, and, and, and finally, you know, then we get into kind of technical integrations and visuals. And so this is the, I, I guess it tends to happen later on in the process for some, for others it's earlier. It's just, it depends on what kind of uh, workflow you have between your conversation design team and your, and, and your development team. Um, but ultimately it's layering on, layering on the full context for your conversational experience. And so you've got, you know, now that you know, here's all of the, here's the full like scope of this conversation experience that's been defined. You can start to, um, you can start to f slot in the, the multimodality, uh, multimodal aspects of the experience. So you can start to see how, uh, how the visuals are gonna underlie that conversation design, how they're gonna support it, um, you know, where, the, where they're gonna be relied upon to, to be the primary communication tool where they are just supporting uh, voice or conversation as the, the, the primary uh, communication tool, where technical integrations are required. I think um, you know, for, for a lot of conversation designers, we're using dummy data to, to validate out the end experience, but in order to get something uh, that, that can really truly test a one-to-one -one experience with our end user experience, we do need uh, we do need it to be fully integrated into our into our services, into our databases, into our into our APIs, uh, and so you know that's where we're often working with the developers to be able to uh, to get those those integrations created at this point in the flow. But you know what what that's doing is taking this dumb end end flow that we've had up to this point, or a, or a, an example end end flow, uh, and making it something that is uh, fully responsive and, and interactive. Uh, for the end user that's engaging with it. And again, this is, you know, this prototype is now, uh, it's now a tool for, for full user testing at this point. And so it has gone from being something to capture very, very high level feedback in your first step of your, of your design process to something that is really, um, that, that is really just a, a representation of your end user experience. And it's just been increasing fidelity uh, throughout that whole process. Cool. And, and so that was that was just kind of summarizing the why a prototype can act as a living document. And then just to just to reiterate those points around uh, around its role as a, as a tool for input and output, as a mechanism to both get context out of your designs to, to those who need it, um, stakeholders, customers, to be able to communicate that context, but also to capture context into it. Um, you know, it, it goes back to conversation design is a team sport. And um, you need the inputs, you need the input of your, t of your team, of your stakeholders, to be able to strengthen your design work. Uh, and you need their feedback to, to you know, help flesh out what full requirements are, what that end user experience is gonna look like. Um, and, and, and you need to be able to communicate, uh, you need to be able to communicate out what the requirements are to actually bring this to life one-to-one. -one. And again, um, you know, just as, as a communication tool, a, a prototype is, you know, a conversation design prototype is, is fantastic because it is showing a, uh, an increasingly accurate representation of the solution that we're designing uh, across all of those components that we're creating, across the, the copy decks, across the, uh, the, the interaction model, across the, the AI that we're training. Like all of these elements, the, they, they come together 
uh, to be represented in a prototype. So it is, you know, it's ultimately the best communication tool. And um, as a mechanism for feedback, it's pretty great because it's ultimately fairly self-serve. Um, prototypes are great because you can send them around. You don't need to be in front of somebody, especially, you know, given today where we're unlikely to be in front of our colleagues for the next who knows how long. Um, it, it's a fairly self-serve mechanism for getting feedback, not just from your internal team, but from stakeholders. Uh, they can interact with it. Um, they, can, they can do that on their own time. Uh, and, and ultimately, you're able to collect feedback and input from their experiences, but they don't necessarily need to be moderated. Um, additionally, prototypes can offer different levels of context for those who need it. Um, some, some people want to see how the sausage is made, others, others don't care. Uh, and, and, and I think you know, that's, that's something that we've, we've tried to accommodate uh, in VoiceFlow is the, you know, being able to test within context of the design on Canvas for those who need a full understanding of what is happening, what is the logic that, the, that is driving the experience, um, what are the paths that we're running through in the flow. But then there's also the ability to just share uh, an interactive end experience because some people just want to want to talk to your conversation design and, and, and interact with it that way. Um, and, and so thinking about your prototype as being, a, being able to communicate at different levels is really important because there are, you know, if, if, if you're in a position where you need to communicate a, a, an Alexa skill to a VP of, a VP of sales, no disrespect to VP of sales on the call, but like they probably don't care this about the specifics of your interaction model. So it's best not to distract them with it. Um, and, and so just, just kind of a, a, a sneak peek in, in terms of some of the things that we're working on this coming quarter, um, just in voice flow to really uh, better drive that prototyping experience, like the ability to share different, uh, different fidelities of prototypes, the ability to customize the prototypes that are shared uh, through our tool, just to be able to offer um, different levels of experience. And then the ability to, to either have like a self-serve experience or a moderated experience. So beyond just kind of the, sh the, the different share phone options or the different, um, the different interfaces for sharing the, your, your prototypes, the ability to, you know, to do something that's highly moderated like WAS testing to something that is completely self-serve like um, you know, just remote, remote testing or, or user tests, sharing, uh, sharing uh, a, uh, an interactive prototype out for user tests. So you know, we're really focused on trying to support those different use cases that you're gonna go through where you're trying to test your designs uh, as they go through the through the work through your conversation design workflow and, and get a little higher and higher fidelity every step along the way. You want to make sure that you can um, you, you can support you can test your prototypes every step. Uh, and then in terms of collecting collecting feedback, you know the um, the 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 goal again here is just to uh, really really make sure that as much context can be provided with the feedback that is given. Um, you know, you want to, you, when you're testing with, when you're testing with users, it's really about very granular tweaks to your designs that are, that are going to improve, that are, they're going to improve edge cases that are going to identify edge cases. And so, you know, we really want to enable teams to have that degree of granularity and, and, and context for the feedback that we're getting. So, you know, something that you'll see come out from, from, from the team, uh, in, in a month or so is, is going to be commenting directly on the canvas so that, you know, as, as you're sharing your designs, as you're prototyping, uh, running prototypes with users, they're able to leave their feedback directly in line with where they are experiencing it. And so, um, you know, we, th this is not a new idea. Like this is a best practice stolen from, from UX design tools, but we just, we understand how important it is that, um, feedback from your design isn't delivered on a different channel or a different uh, uh, document where the where where the uh, where you're communicating the design itself, and so you know we hope that this is really going to create a much more contextual testing experience. So we got ten minutes to go here. Big finish. 
Uh, all that is to say is, you know, we've got a, we've got a very opinionated view here at VoiceFlow that, that good conversation design is ultimately um, a result of good conversation design documentation. Uh, it, it, unless you are able to, to package up, to communicate, uh, to make your designs experienceable by those who are going to be delivering on them or those who are going to be approving them, um, then, then the end experience is never going to be uh, what you intended it to be. And you know, the, the best tool that we believe is going to get us there is solid conversation design prototyping. And that's something that we're going to be putting, uh, putting a lot of work towards this coming quarter. So, um, you know, keep, stay tuned. We'd love to get you testing out some of the things we're building. We'd love to get your feedback on it. We'd love to hear how you're using it so that uh, we can turn a, a pretty good V1 into a, into a solid uh, V whatever comes after that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, I'm gonna quickly take over the screen and we're gonna get to some of the questions that are in the Q&A as we wrap up. Thanks so much. And guys, if you have any other questions that you would like to add, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We're gonna be going through those now. All righty. Cool. So the first question that we have on deck is uh, from Siebel. And this is about what's your opinion on what type of methodology works best with conversation design? Um, is agile methodology a good method to use for voice and conversation design? Yeah, I think this is agile or human centered design. Um, they, they all kind of focus around the core principle of you know, iterative design where you're, where you're rolling new information and feedback into the, your design work uh, with each successive iteration to make it a, a better design to hone in on what the right solution is. And so ultimately, yeah, I think it's the exact same. Um, it's the exact same context for conversation designers where, you know, you really want to iterate over the life cycle of a project and, and beyond that to be able to, um, to be able to strengthen what that solution is. And so, you know, agile is a good mechanism because it for forces you to, to, to chunk out the problems you solve and, and get more and more granular as you go with it. Uh, human centered design, uh, which, which I have a lot, you know, more experience with from the, from my design days that, you know, it, it's, it's sort of the same thing. What are the, what are the biggest problems that our solution can address? Let's focus in on those and then test, learn, release, and then start to go, okay, what's the next biggest piece? Oh, we actually didn't solve the previous pro solution very well. Let's go back to that one. And so it allows you to kind of uh, work in iterative design cycles. Awesome. Uh, the next question comes from Richard. He asked, as VoiceLow becomes more of a document documentation tool, have you considered having a note section on any block to communicate content outside of the actual conversation? That's interesting. Um, no, we, we, we've never we've never considered that specific, uh, I guess, solution to that problem. I think um, what what you saw with all of the, the the content on the canvas there is is our canvas markup function, and you know we we really we really saw that as kind of a catch all way to communicate additional context. Uh, so you know the, that was done with an intention to solve, I think, the problem that you're talking about there, but. Um, you know, we, 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 haven't, we haven't talked about that specific solution that you've given there, but that, that's great kind of fodder for the team here. Awesome. Uh, and then another question from Ralph is more of kind of your opinion. So we've heard a lot about the term situational design. It was introduced last year by the Alexa team and spread around amongst other tools in the market as well. What are your thoughts on situational design and, and how does it fit in with the topic of documentation? Yeah, I think that's, you know, it, it's, it's a hot topic for a good reason. I think the, um, you know, we've got very V V one of, uh, voice experiences of conversation experiences were very, uh, you know, they, they were very kind of standard. They were very, uh, templated and uh, until we can apply proper situation design to them, 
they're, they're not going to be able to be dynamic to the specifics of users, to uh, the specific use case that a user is using it in. And, but that, that's really, you know, what is going to make these things more accessible. Um, it, it's, it, so yeah, like certainly that, that's something that we're thinking about here. We're, we're thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we enable people to, to apply situation design to their conversations when they're creating them in voice flow. Um, and because, you know, it's, it's going to be a core function of the work done on conversation design uh, for conversation designers. And, and I think a lot of, we, we, on the previous question, we talked about, you know, like the iterative work. When we build something, we're probably thinking of the primary kind of situations of use, but you know, what we're going to continue to iterate on and, and, and keep, uh, putting work in towards our conversation experiences around is new situations, new contexts of use that we need to account for. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. So as we're kind of tapering off here, um, any parting wisdom for the people in the audience? Me. Oh, um, parting wisdom. Um, Share, share what you're working on with, the, with other conversation designers so we can all learn from each other. I have been uh, the recipient of so much fantastic insight and wisdom from those who have been uh, doing this work so much longer than I have, and I am so truly appreciative of it. Appreciate, appreciative of it. Um, you know, we're, we're still a pretty small community. We all benefit from, from learning and, and sharing best practices. So, um, Please do that. I, I say that completely selfishly, but I, I know that it benefits everyone else. So, you know, don't be afraid to talk about your work. Um, and for those of you who are interested in joining more events like these, we have a jam-packed uh, July, starting with tomorrow. Uh, Nico, our VoiceFlow Studio lead, is going to walk you through on how to build a podcast app in VoiceFlow. Then we're going to be featuring a conversation designer who used to work at Sandra, Pull String, and has worked amongst the, amongst the team at HBO, at Alexa themselves, and beyond. So definitely check that out. And last but not least, we'll have another workshop uh, finishing off in July on structuring a conversational product team hosted by Braden, the CEO of VoiceLow. So thanks so much, guys. And as Rob mentioned, we'd love to hear what you're working on. We'd love to see what any way that we can benefit a little bit more from sharing together. So definitely take a look at our community. If you're not already part of that, you can find that on Facebook or by clicking the bit.ly link below. And last but not least, if you have any feedback, if you'd like to check out any events that are upcoming or any of our past streams, check out voiceload.com slash events. We'd love to see you again. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you very much. This was so much fun. I appreciate everyone showing up.